Caitlin. All right, um, I'd like to welcome you all to the second uh, talk of Glodem Book Club. Today we have the great pleasure of hosting Roxana Radu, um, and she will speak about her book from um, published by Oxford University Press. Uh, before we move on to the book talk, I'd like to give you a brief uh, introduction to uh, Dr. Radu, uh, who is a departmental lecturer in technology and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government of the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on the governance of digital technologies and internet related policymaking. She's the author of the monograph Negotiating Internet Governance, which she will present to us today, inspired by her work with the diplomatic community in Geneva. Since 2020, she has been the program chair of the Global Internet Governance Academic Network. And prior to joining um, the Blavatnik School, Roxana Radu was a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Social Legal Studies, again at the University of Oxford, and a research associate at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. She holds a PhD in international relations from the Graduate Institute and a master's degree in political science from the Central European University. Without further ado, I will turn to uh, Dr. Radu and um, we'll start with my first question that is, can you tell a little bit about your book um, before I move on to my other questions? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today and talk about my book. How did uh, the book come about? Um, the book is actually born from uh, my uh, doctoral work. I've spent a number of years uh, researching the internet governance communities and also collected data. I've classified um, governance instruments and tried to put everything together so that there is a uh, comprehensive uh, story to tell of what was happening with the internet. So the book presents the history of the internet from a governance perspective. It starts with the early days of connecting computers and the set of informal relations that various technical community uh, people had. And it goes all the way to UN processes and multilateral negotiations that became uh, key to current uh, discussions. Uh, so I stopped um, the um, data collection for the book in uh, 2018, and I've added a, um, a set of reflections on what was happening uh, for the period that, uh, that uh, uh, went from when I actually finished writing the book all the way to when uh, it got published. So I did that during my, my postdoc in Oxford, and I had the time to actually go back to some of the experiences um, from, the, from the practical side. So I, I spent some time working with the diplomatic community in Geneva, and that gave me the opportunity to test some of the assumptions of um, the PhD thesis, to challenge some of the things that I had previously written, and revise a manuscript that then turned into a book. So I think the, the book is actually um, um, an experience that very much reflects uh, my own career and trajectory from an initial draft all the way to, to the final product, uh, which got published in 2019. And, uh, I would say it's um, it's a collection of um, of ideas in, and stages in my life more than anything. Thank you so much. And um, could you also tell us a little bit about what inspired you to um, conduct this research, um, writing a PhD on it? Yeah, I have to go back in time and think about uh, the early days when the idea um, came to me to actually work on a comprehensive understanding of the governance mechanisms for, for the internet. 
at, at the outset, it came from a frustration that I had uh, because I was trying to make sense of everything that was happening and I still couldn't grasp it. There was a lot going on. But there was um, uh, a bit of ambiguity in the way people were referring to concepts. There was a terminological confusion as well, whether this was only about the internet, whether this was about digital policy, whether it was cyber and cybersecurity and cyberspace. Uh, there was a lot going on and I was, as a student of uh, international relations and politics uh, coming uh, into this field, I was very frustrated that I simply couldn't really make sense of it. Um, and that went on for about a year. I was uh, studying very, very deeply uh, the literature. I looked at everything that was happening and then about a year later, we had the Snowden revelations. And that gave us completely new information about the field, about what was happening, about uh, different power positions. And of course, a lot of, a lot of new information about um, uh, surveillance activities and with that also espionage. So in the middle of my uh, PhD research, a lot was changing and I had to go back to what I had previously written and researched and put on my critical uh, lens and rewrite everything. So I would say the inspiration really come, came from this original frustration and later on from the disappointment that uh, there was such a big gap between what we are trying to do academically to explain uh, the works in the field of internet governance and what policymakers were doing. There was no direct communication between these communities and I felt there was a lot of opportunity that uh, was simply missed and having these communities inform each other would benefit um, everyone including us, the day-to-day -day users of the internet. Um, so more than, you know, an outside inspiration, a magic quote that came from uh, somebody, uh, it was really the lived experience. The fact that I was part of these communities and that I, I was struggling myself to make sense of things. And also that I was uh, seeing um, the big gap um, that, communicating in silos would bring to, to the field. So I needed to, to bridge that gap and um, write something that would um, help everybody understand better what was happening in the field and also allow people to become involved if they wanted to. One of the big issues still debated to this day in internet governance is uh, in fact the participation of um, the regular user the people who are benefiting from technology on a daily basis or are faced with the risks that technology brings about are rarely ever um, asked about their opinion in otherwise rather inclusive decision-making processes. Um, so the question of uh, who gets to sit at the table and who are the stakeholders that get to negotiate internet governance was uh, something very, very important for me. And I situated um, the analysis of the book around this, around um, who gets to articulate policies for the internet and why that is the case. There's obviously a historic explanation, but there are also uh, more mundane explanation that might have to do with, um, uh, with um, the way the community operates or practices or simply, um, arrangements that date uh, before, from before the internet. So I'll stop here and see if I answered your question. <laughs> yes, you did. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, so thank you so much. And the, the next question I had in mind is actually in a way connected to this. I mean, it's really great and also exciting uh, for our grad students who are also listening to um, this talk to see how such research uh, can originate out of intellectual curiosity um, because sometimes we see students facing this challenge of how do we 
get excited about a topic and spend five years of our youth uh, conducting research on it, um, it shouldn't be just uh, a topic that seems to be, uh, you know, a hot topic of the day uh, or so on. It, it needs to, in a way, motivate us, I guess. Um, that's how a book is, is produced at the end of the day. Um, so the next question is going to be about actually um, the, the interactions you had with this community and how that informed the book in a way because um, you have this academic background, but the book is actually very much speaking to policy making at the same time. So while writing the book, did you try to, um, in a way, shape the, the language accordingly to make it maybe more readable for a wider audience? This was indeed a struggle because uh, part of the research uh, was conducted during the PhD. And as we know, there are academic requirements uh, to speak to the discipline and also to um, come up with your theorization of what is happening in the field. So that was very much a theoretical engagement. And the challenge was to bring this um, to policymakers and to make it relevant for them. Uh, so to me, that was particularly important because, because of that initial frustration that I talked about, the fact that uh, when I came to this topic, I, I felt that there wasn't sufficient information. And if the information was there, it wasn't communicated properly. So I wanted to do a better job and I wanted to make this comprehensive and accessible to everyone. So, in fact, I had two versions. I had a PhD version that was uh, speaking more to the discipline and to my academic colleagues. And for the book, I worked a lot on um, removing that information that wouldn't have uh, benefited um, somebody just interested in the topic. So the excess of, um, of theoretic information um, and everything that was not directly relevant to, um, to the argument I was making. So I simplified um, the manuscript for the publication. So the book is actually a simplification of what has been uh, done during my doctoral research work, but it's also, the book is much more infused with my own reflections on the process, something that I didn't uh, do for, for the PhD itself. Uh, so the book allowed me the opportunity to come in and reflect on what was happening and how much some of the dynamics that uh, I'm talking about in the books, for example, this move from hard law to soft law and going back to hard law, how much of that was uh, actually a political um, outcome and how the negotiations in different rooms, whether at the UN or in other fora, were impacting um, this, these dynamics. So just having the opportunity to, to go back to those communities and actually to be in those rooms where the discussions were taking place shaped a lot my understanding of, of the topic and uh, helped me create a book that, uh, that I think speaks more to, to this wider audience. Uh, but again, the challenge was also to be there in those rooms as a researcher and not as a participant in the process. <laughs> when I originally came in, I was um, a member of these communities and I was interested in, in participating in those policy processes. And here we're talking about some of the technical communities uh, that are dealing with standards and protocols. And there are some of the policy communities, uh, most of them interact. And then there are communities around UN processes like the Internet Governance Forum, like the UN Open-Ended Working Group on um, responsibility, state responsibility in cyberspace. So there are a number of communities that overlap to a large extent, but that are in charge of various processes. And of course, there are also the national representatives and sometimes we would have consultations with the national delegations. And in all of these exchanges, I, I felt that everybody was uneasy with, uh, with the complexity of the field and with the fact that there wasn't a way um, to, to grasp what was, what was happening uh, with the limited time we all have. So a way to bring everything together was uh, something that the majority of the people I interacted with thought. 
and somehow became my mission while writing the book to make it as uh, as easy to understand and as uh, comprehensive as, as possible. Um, can we also talk about the the profile of the community in that um, what occupations do you see? It's probably more um, interdisciplinary than um, our very own academic field, maybe. I'm comparing, for example, my own work since it's mostly about on the IMF, I mostly interact with economists. Right. Uh, but you probably have a wide range of people um, that, that you interacted with while writing the book. Absolutely. And I benefited from, from these interactions and this diversity of backgrounds. Um, so in the internet community, you would have a lot of uh, technologists people who really deal with the nitty gritty part of uh, computing. We would also have a lot of lawyers and particularly people interested in international law or domestic law. Uh, we would also have sociologists and anthropologists, admittedly not as many as technologists, but there are uh, quite a few of them. And then many political scientists participate in these processes. Um, so the mix is, uh, is quite interesting. And then it's also important to look at um, the career trajectory of these um, individuals, because a lot of them are uh, experienced policymakers, and their background might be in public administration or public policy, but they come to the field with uh, a set of expectations and a mission um, that, uh, that they have to pursue. Then we have uh, industry representatives, and again, their background can be uh, quite, uh, quite diverse from uh, people on the technology side, all the way to people on the policy side or government affairs and so on and so forth. And there again, um, I think the set of interests that they bring to the table is, is quite diverse. And then we have civil society members that tend to be the most diverse where you'd have a lot of preoccupation with inequalities, with uh, situations of digital divide. Um, so many of the people that bring to the table the social concerns with actually be in um, in the civil society group. And then we also have academic experts, obviously, of <laughs> all uh, different specializations, uh, from legal scholars to international relations scholars. And interestingly enough, sometimes you would also have hackers at the table. You would have people who are in various camps. Obviously, these would be the white hackers, as we call them. So the people interested in advancing the policies and not uh, in committing fraud or stealing or information or uh, you know compromising uh, somebody's data but sometimes they would be at the table and i found that exchange quite interesting as well um we actually got a question from the audience which is very much related to what i've just asked so uh if you don't mind we can take that maybe and then continue with um, the other questions i'll read it out loud for those who are listening to the recording uh, of the talk uh, the question is from Mete Yildiz. How do you overcome the challenges of following up the scientific developments in several disciplines that feed your work? It's a very difficult one. <laughs> Thank you for this question. It's hard to stay on top of what is happening. Um, for me, it was key to uh, be up to date with the reading, so I was doing that a lot. But it was also important to participate in, in the discussions and meet the community. And a lot of the key information for uh, these developments would come from, from these informal interactions with uh, people in the community. So uh, you would attend, for example, a five-day UN convened meeting. And not only you would benefit from uh, what um, the room was uh, thinking about, so just having that uh, that information on the latest um, policy discussions, but also from those informal conversations over coffee, where this was obviously prior to, to the pandemic hitting. And yeah, in those informal conversations, you would always uh, be uh, informed about um, various initiatives. And I would go home and read about that a lot. That would happen after almost every meeting because there's always more to learn. And uh, in many cases, maybe I had a 
the right information about what was going on, but I didn't have the substance. And um, I need to go back and, and check those documents and link up to other people to get more information. Yeah, so it was a, a constant uh, learning process. And I think it still is to this day. It's um, not, uh, not at all easy to, to stay on top of what, uh, what is happening in a field that is developing at such a fast pace. Um, and finding, in a way, a common language to speak with people coming from such diverse um, backgrounds must be challenging uh, as well. I mean, what happens when um, the other participants in the community do not necessarily spare the same amount of time to follow um, your language, let's say? Um, hmm um not yeah, blaming the engineers but you know <laughs> if if it comes to that like you know the the tech side um maybe using terms that are not necessarily finding the same meaning um in your field absolutely i think we see a lot of that to these days we see discussions not happening because um people cannot agree on the basic terms. So this is still the case today. We've done a lot to improve the situation. There's progress in a number of areas, but there's still so much that still has to be sorted out. Um, if we look at um, norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, there's still a discussion going on around what uh, state responsibility might mean in that context, around attribution and how that could be done around the very meaning of cybersecurity. So we go down to the basics and we, we find that there's still no agreement. But it's also important to note that um, certain communities have deliberately used this um, confusion over terminology to stop certain discussions. We've seen it um, with uh, a number of states in UN processes where um, certain initiatives did not move forward because there was no agreement on the basic terms, but we've also seen it with uh, uh, situations that I talk about in the book, for example, um, Facebook using the terminology of a Facebook community to set the uh, terms and conditions for the use of the platform. And this was very much challenged by communities that felt they were self-organized communities on various platforms including facebook um, so the idea of who gets to set the rules and how that might be called uh, comes into question as well uh, with with facebook the pushback was um, grounded in the fact that the policies of the platform actually did not come from the community the community was never consulted but came from a number of offices that um, Facebook had around the world where people were simply doing their jobs uh, on a Facebook uh, paycheck and designing these rules. It wasn't so much about the community of users as the name might, have in, might indicate to many people, but about those public policy officers sitting down and designing a set of rules. And once this controversy made it to the media, then the company changed policy and it acted on it. It said, well, now we actually have to speak to the largest um, user base that we have, which might be India, and see whether the rules that we apply in India differ from the rules that we might want to apply in the US. This debate is still going on. Of course, we've seen the company um, at the forefront of many discussions, including uh, in reports issued by the UN on the situation in Myanmar. There are a number of controversies related to content moderation that have now become uh, headlines. But the very issue of community and who decides on community standards, is still very much debated. Thank you very much. Um, there is a follow-up question from uh, Mitya Yildiz. I'll read that out loud. Um, which scientific organizations and journals would you suggest us to follow closely in order to stay on top of things as you try to do? There are a number of them. If we wanted to look more at the policy side, I would say definitely follow the UN processes. Uh, there are about four or five of them at the moment that are quite interesting. So there's 
the Internet uh, Governance Forum, that is the only open platform to discuss internet related issues. The Internet Governance Forum does not have uh, the power to issue binding decisions, but it is uh, an open forum. There are a number of discussions uh, taking place throughout the years and also an annual conference that uh, is extremely, extremely informative. So that would be one venue. Then there are a couple of political processes happening in the UN. Uh, one is the open-ended working group on cybersecurity. And there, I think we can see uh, state diplomacy in practice. We have um, lots of interesting interactions uh, inside the UN and around the UN uh, for this particular process that is um, set to design norms and potentially at some point uh, rules for how states engage in cyberspace. We also have a cybercrime treaty uh, negotiation going on. Uh, this is based on an initiative from, uh, from Russia, co-sponsored by China, uh, that is set to design a global convention to fight cybercrime, uh, to counter the use of criminal, the, the criminal use of the internet. I think that is the official name uh, in the UN. So that particular process is uh, interesting to follow as well for anybody that um, that looks at statecraft and um, state negotiations. We also have uh, the digital arena as a priority for the UN Secretary General and the report issued by, by the Secretary General that identified certain priorities for a UN reform to better address digital affairs. So there is uh, right now an entire discussion around digital cooperation and that involves uh, obviously UN stakeholders, but also uh, private um, actors, uh, both for-profit organizations and non-for-profit. Uh, and there is a unit inside the UN that is now um, taking care of advancing this, uh, this agenda. So I would say these are some interesting venues to follow in terms of uh, just in terms of policy making. But when we look at the academic realm, then we have um, uh, an annual conference uh, that I'm co-chairing linked to the IGF that happens uh, at the end of uh, the year. It's, um, it's part of uh, the activities of GIGANET, the Global Internet Governance Academic Community. And uh, we also have a number of other conferences that take place on an annual basis that are very interesting to follow. So there's the telecommunication policy uh, meeting in the US. Uh, there are um, smaller meetings such as the, um, the Hague uh, Center for uh, Cyber Norms meeting uh, happening uh, regularly where you would get the um, cutting edge research of uh, yeah of uh, anyone who is really interested in in the topic and then obviously the bigger conferences such as the International Studies Association would have subsections on international um, communications uh, or cyber politics that are again interesting uh, to follow and I would say um, certain publishers also have a special series that are dedicated to digital issues and I, I generally follow also what what is published um, in this series of course uh, the book which is actually uh, right at the back of you, I think that's, I can see in the background the book, right? Um, so it's, as far as I know, it's open access. So you can also, that's what we're gonna share after um, the uh, seminar, of course, I mean, the talk, uh, the link to it. So uh, you can also uh, read the book, uh, the e-copy of it can be downloaded. Um, I see one more question. Oh, well, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Rado, for your answer. Um, so I will continue with my uh, questions about the writing process of the book because I mean it builds on your doctoral research. Um, so I mean I assume um, the manuscript that you had was actually split into uh, a standard PhD uh, dissertation with an intro lit review um, and the the case studies so on and so forth. Transforming that into a book uh, must be another 
challenge, I believe. Um, what was the process you, you followed one while doing that? So what were the cases you had to leave out of the book or um, how did you really make it a, a, a book that is more readable once again for a, a wider audience? Yeah, there was a lot of work happening to, to um, yeah, transform the initial manuscript that I had into a book and there were a lot of revisions to get there. So I started by um, simplifying the information I had in the book, in the, in the PhD manuscript, because I wanted this to be accessible. And at that point, I wanted the book to tell a story as well. It wasn't uh, necessarily about the linkages to the different theories and how this was speaking to certain hypotheses and so on, but it was more about telling the story of how we got where we are with governing the internet and why certain things ended up being governed and others are completely um, outside of, um, of state control. Um, and also sometimes outside of uh, pure regulation. So we, we are seeing a diversity of, uh, of sub domains and uh, modes of governance that are at play. And to explain that, I needed to go back to the manuscript I had, um, simplify and leave only the theoretical insights that, um, that were absolutely critical to, to my argument. And yeah, pretty much work on on turning the um, the chapters into a story that would build uh, in a natural way. So uh, I had a lot of data on the history of the internet, and I collected data about the various um, instruments. But I I split that into three different chapters, so I could present each one of them in enough detail but also that it would be, again, understandable to a wider audience. So I start with this periodization of the internet history. And um, I talk about a mode of governance that was dominating in each of these three periods. So we start with the early days of the internet and uh, the informal governance arrangements around it. Then we look at the 90s when the internet is both privatized and globalized. And we see a mix of uh, modes of governance, but we mostly see uh, an attempt to govern the internet based on what already existed for other means of telecommunications. And as of 2005, we see a completely different approach to governing the digital world, and we see an interest in designing new, new instruments that are specific for the internet and uh, that are adequate to, to the new um, uh, environment. So with this in mind, I looked at uh, the most relevant cases that could, uh, could provide a, uh, an illustration of this means of governance. And for the first period, so the early days of the internet, I look at um, a standard that comes from the technical community that is called uh, request for comments. This was a simple procedure that um, uh, technologists who are sitting in the same room were using whenever they were done with a draft for a standard or a protocol. They would just ask their peers for comments, which is no different than what some academics are doing. But this became a standard because the person in charge of reporting this to the funders wanted to uh, be in a position to say we have actually checked everything and we've received the approval of, of our colleagues before putting this forward and we've just used this RFC request for comments and right now this is the main way of doing things in the technical community nothing can be pushed forward without a request for comments this became the most important consultative means that exists for the digital for the technological um, side of things. So for everything that has to do with a technical standard, you would have to rely on a request for comments. And this would all be published and you could go back to them. And uh, nobody can modify them. They stay in that version, they were approved, but anybody can propose a new standard and subsequently go through this procedure of a request for comments. That's one of the, 
the ways I identified that was telling the story of what I wanted to show that it was all about informal governance that then became formalized. For the 90s, we had the um, the multi-stakeholder practice. We had um, the invitation to different stakeholders to come and sit together and create new policies from scratch. And these policies uh, were coming at a time when a lot of the regulation for the internet was just inspired by other existing regulations on telecommunication. So it wasn't necessarily well adapted, but it also came so them sitting together at the table with uh, different opinions and different worldviews also created something new for um, the way things are done for the internet, namely um, the multi-stakeholder practice. And this is now so embedded in everything that is uh, done for the internet that it's impossible to come up with a new governance arrangement that would not at least include a multi-stakeholder consultation prior to, to being issued. Um, so this also um, materialized into a practice that is, uh, is key to how things are done. And then for the period that goes from 2005 all the way to 2018, we're seeing uh, a huge reliance on so-called ad hoc expert groups. Whereas many processes, especially global processes, um, come to a deadlock. And in many cases, the solution proposed is, oh, let's just have a smaller working group that can deal with this and come back to the big group and uh, renegotiate uh, certain positions. Uh, for the internet uh, governance community, this is um, very, very interesting because this happened not only in extremely formalized processes, but also in much more we could say even informal processes, the delegation to an expert group that would then come up with the answer and then the answer would be integrated in the solution um, is something that became dominant. And I talk about this as well. And yeah, in the end, it is important to, to keep in mind that we, we have moved from one practice to another, but obviously they all stay there in the background. And then there is the very practice of the community that is added on top of this. And there I talk about newcomers and old comers, um, about seniority in the group, about the use of first names when, in how people address each other uh, in different meetings room, about different alliances and different uh, groups only going to a number of conferences, but not others. Uh, so it became, becomes extremely, extremely interesting to, to follow the nucleus of this group, but also what is happening on the edges and how the newcomers are educated into following these practices, because it doesn't end with, with um, uh, the people that have been there for a decade. New ones are coming and they are taught what uh, rules they, the community is following and then they become the ones uh, preaching this to, to the next generation. So it's extremely interesting to, to see this happening as we speak because with internet governance, uh, the community is relatively new. It dates back um, some 30 years ago, but it is not that long. It's fascinating actually. And I mean, as much as we try to um, avoid sometimes using international relations theories, I couldn't help but wonder um, if constructivism is actually at the core of, of, um, of the research, the perspective you take on board. Um, at the state level, I wonder if there is another camp in writing in this field saying it's really the state interests that really drive um, um, the, the, the politics of internet governance. But we, of course, see, um, again, from your book, that um, the norms are very much constructed by um, the community. Yeah, I see myself as a constructivist um, and my own position in this community and observing these uh, rules was part of, of the challenge for writing the book. Um, it's hard to reflect on your own experience as part of the group and even be there in an observer role when you are known to be able to contribute to those discussions. So removing yourself from the conversation, being there just as an observer, um, 
simply not co-creating the solution, but observing it and analyzing and applying a set of analytical tools to distance yourself from the people that you actually get to know quite well, that you go to coffee with, and um, that uh, you know you respect, that uh, you you sometimes simply challenge, that you don't necessarily respect that much, but just understanding where that limit is becomes a, a constant challenge when you're there as an observer. So I also needed in my in my own analysis a more quantitative part to make sure that whatever I'm seeing in terms of qualitative analysis is not biased by my own opinions, by my own involvement in the process. Therefore, I spend a lot of time collecting governance instruments and classifying them and going back to the original documents uh, to discover that many of the things that I thought were understood were actually myths in the community. They were not necessarily like that from the start. When you go and read the actual documents from the 80s, from the 90s, you discover a very different reality. And with that knowledge, I could go back into these meeting rooms and be there simply as an observer. It was a lot easier to be there once uh, the quantitative research was done. And I felt I had that knowledge coming from documents. Of course, documents don't capture everything, but they capture a number of discussions that happened in the past when you were not in the room. And with that knowledge, I could be back in the room and, uh, and analyze um, many of the discussions in a different light. So that, that helped me a lot, having uh, the possibility to rely also on, on my own analysis of uh, existing documents. So using a mixed method in that actually gives some, um, in a way, um, a comfort uh, in, in also, I guess, speaking with um, our um, interviewees, if we're interviewing or um, if we're doing an ethnographic research, then um, becoming part of the work is, of course, it's always challenging. And um, sometimes there are skeptical participants in the research um, who question things, of course. Um, but uh, I mean, it, I can see how much you really enjoyed the entire process. Um, and so um, that's again, I mean, an inspiration um, for, for those who are uh, planning to, to write a book uh, that's coming from their uh, doctoral dissertations. Um, I had another question actually, um, which is more about the project that we are involved in uh, together. We actually happen to be in the uh, same working group um, for the algorithmic governance, um, where we spoke about divergences and convergences of global south. Um, about algorithmic governance, I mean, implying that to maybe this is beyond the scope of uh, the book, but I mean, maybe for future research or maybe you already um, spoke about it in the book. Um, I mean, as internet governance evolved over time, um, did we start seeing more participation from the global south? And what are really the um, the, the divergences and convergences in um, the concerns raised um, from different regions? Thank you. This is a very good question. Looking at the history of the internet, we see very clearly that um, there was this uneven start that the north, the global north, had a lot more of a say in the processes than the south. Maybe this does not come as a surprise, but for a community that was preaching inclusion and, um, and accessibility and was actually concerned with connectivity in different parts of the world, it was quite striking to see that there was uh, no visible reflection of that community in many of the conversations. What has happened over time was a formalization of, um, of rules to go in that direction. So many communities did not automatically have a representative from the South. They did not necessarily put on the agenda issues that were of interest to uh, people in India and in China and in Latin America. But uh, gradually this came to be the case because because of two different mechanisms. One was um, countries and 
populations themselves pushing for a better representation in these communities. Um, so I remember very clearly sitting in meetings where you would have a Chinese delegate talking about the majority of users of the internet actually being in China and the fact that they could not use a Chinese script to code anything on the internet because that was simply not existing at that point in time. And the efforts they were, um, they were involved in to create that, to have that script available, to have uh, domain names that you could type in Mandarin and not necessarily in English because it's not super intuitive to a user from a different part of the world. And I think it's also the case for Turkey and Turkey had this much more recently within ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, being able to use uh, domain names in Turkish uh, special characters and being able to um, not only have content hosted on a website that uh, was scripted in Latin, but actually doing everything in Turkish came much later than it was the case for the Americans. Same with Greek, same with many languages that uh, are, we could say, not the most widespread languages out there, but that are important for both uh, the use of the internet and the preservation of that cultural heritage. So we've seen a lot of advancement in that sense. So the push from these communities themselves to be better represented um, on a technical level, but also in policy making. And then we've also seen an awareness within the community that the other voices need to be um, heard, that uh, issues from local communities never make it to the global level. And this active um, approach that many have taken um, to include uh, representatives of small island states uh, that might have very different connectivity problems all the way to uh, you know large um, grassroots movements in in india so we've seen a wide variety of uh, of um, tools used to increase diversity uh, from really inviting specifically people to to be on these committees but then the issue is that there's always one person that gets invited to be part of everything because there aren't that many people known to the community. So it becomes very difficult for one person to manage everything and it also becomes very difficult to do the actual representation. They have simply no time to talk to their communities. They are always in meetings, always going somewhere. Uh, we've also seen um, um, appointments that reflect regional diversity. Um, so making sure that whenever there is a, a committee set up, um, people can apply from different parts of the world and they would have um, seats allocated for various parts of the world, which is different than just saying competing in a global competition where there are two seats available for anyone, so making sure that this regional uh, representation is there. And I think we've also seen um, this attempt to really um, place uh, high profile people from various communities in the global south in the most important meetings. Um, so maybe not uh, everybody could be uh, included, but at least they would make sure to have some voices um, there. And it has been successful to a certain extent. It has taken decades, though. It, we must say that it has been a really long process. It has been successful to a certain extent, but my observation from the, uh, the history of the internet is that we have learned a lot, and that information right now is not transferred to emerging topics like algorithmic governance. Unfortunately, we haven't taken um, the status quo of internet governance as our departing point. We are back to what was happening to this community in the 90s. We're back to just figuring out the new rules, whereas we've learned a lot that could simply be transferred to our new discussions and new policy debates. Um, but we are, we are reluctant for some reason to, to take on board all of these advances. And speaking of more inclusiveness, um, can we also talk about improvement in uh, gender balance uh, in the community? Yeah, absolutely. There is uh, an entire discussion to, to be had around this. 
um, it, it comes to no surprise that uh, as no surprise that we we had many technologists in the early days and among them very few were actually women but this brings me back to uh, a myth uh, from the early days of the internet namely that we only had internet fathers and not mothers this is not true <laughs> turns out there were many mothers but some of them even had to take male names to be accepted by the community we had a number of women involved in everything that had to do with arpa and arpanet so the initial uh, version of the internet. This was the precursor of the internet. Uh, they were there in various positions from leadership positions all the way to administrators of the program. And many of them were technologists themselves. So when they were discussing the various, uh, the various proposals and they could do it online at some point. So after 72, um, they decided that they were going to manage this process in a way that uh, nobody could challenge it. So you have to remember that the internet was initially a military project and all the people that were part of these conversations were vetted by the, the government to be there. They had the credentials, they had the security screening to be in the room. And so did the women. But some of the people who were involved in these early discussions were in the military themselves. They had uh, the rankings and they had a lot of uh, a lot of um, um, let's say they had big big egos and in order not to to compromise the discussions and go down to well who are you to be saying this I have all of this uh, uh, experience and I've been here for a while and I know best the interests of the country or I know best the interests of this project to avoid these conversations, uh, they allocated uh, nicknames to everybody. And those nicknames ten tended to be male nicknames. So the women themselves took male nicknames in, in that process. That's, uh, that's just one anecdote from, from the early days. Uh, but again, gender uh, balance, we're not yet there. We, we're seeing this uh, push right now to make um, companies company boards more even in terms of gender distribution, we're seeing uh, the same effort within the UN to have uh, representation uh, in, in all the different committees, but uh, you will still have in the room about 70% men and only 30% women. It's, it's changing, but it's changing very, very slowly, unfortunately. Um, and if we look at other communities that are actively involved in developing the internet, like uh, um, the developers themselves, those who create the websites, who create programs, the imbalance is even more striking. We have between six and 10% um, of those working as developers identifying as women. So it is um, a rather stark um, situation and we we need to act on it we need to be able to allow for more more women to sit at the table and to to facilitate that for for everybody who is interested and again it's women it's women of color it's all the intersections that come come with gender and i think the the discussion of simply having inclusive approaches is not sufficient because an inclusive approach in which everybody is given the same opportunity to apply for an appointment uh, is simply not inclusive enough. What we need is uh, reaching out to those communities in ways that speak to them, addressing the topics that they are interested in, and uh, creating those bridges that are not simply on a on a formal level. Sure, I was left in the dark for a second. <laughs> I can see this. Yes. Speaking of, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I mean, there is actually one last question in um, the Q&A. Maybe we can take that and conclude um, from Meteildis. Can you briefly tell us the story of coming up with the concept of norm, norm fair as a case study of concept building? Yes, it's an interesting one. <laughs> We've had the um, a number of discussions with with my co-authors for that piece on what to actually call it so we we decided to 
go with norm fair as this assiduous search for new norms that would apply to cyberspace and to the governance of the internet because we're seeing these parallel movements in various places in various avenues um, simply to create new norms and get as many uh, communities as possible to adhere to those new rules of the game and we thought about uh, warfare and just some of the techniques used in in yeah the manipulation that has to do with uh, with a war situation we thought about this assiduousness um, and constant search for a different uh, reality and we we also got inspiration from something called lawfare where there's this contest of norms and legal rules and we decided to come up with um, with a new word that would represent better what we had in mind um, namely norm fair so there's the the normative uh, search but um done in in ways that are very similar to what we would call war warfare some of the techniques and tactics to to get to it uh, are those uh, those used in uh, in other activities that might be closer to either legal um, uh, assertion or or war or situations Thank you so much. With that, I guess we can maybe conclude the talk because I know you have other commitments to attend to. On behalf of GLODAM, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for this really fantastic book talk. I very much look forward to reading the book um, and uh, recommend everyone to uh, go to the link that we'll be sharing with you. Um, click there and uh, download your copy um, and of course, again, the recording will be accessible uh, via our YouTube channel and uh, GLODAM website. Um, and if you have any questions, I guess you can reach out to uh, Dr. Radu. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, do you like to add, would you like to add any concluding remarks um, before I, I stop the recording? I just wanted to thank you once more for this opportunity and to invite everybody to have a look at the book you can just skim through uh, read the part that you're interested in i'm hoping it's well structured so that you can get to the information you need immediately and also to just uh, extend them um, uh, the opportunity to to remain in touch please feel free to to contact me we can circulate the email address after after this session and uh, i would be very pleased to hear from you thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Roxana, and um, I hope we can get to meet in person at some point this year uh, when I visit you in Oxford. I hope that's going to happen. Fingers crossed. Um, well, with the pandemic, we never know, but that's at least the plan for now. So I'll pause recording. <laughs>